All right, any questions on any of the GI stuff we covered Tuesday? All right, so we'll do we'll finish up the GI section here, and then we'll do a little bit of review for the test. So if you guys have any burning questions, because I know you guys have been looking at that stuff consistently throughout the time since the lectures, right? No. Okay, well, we'll do some review and see if you guys have any questions. All right, so we'll start out with uh, inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome. So some new meds uh, that we can use to treat these conditions. So when we're talking about inflammatory bowel disease, these are primarily going to consist of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Have you guys covered any of this yet? Yeah. At least be somewhat familiar with it, right? Um, <clears throat> Essentially, you're going to see that where the disease manifests is going to differ between the two, where ulcerative colitis is typically located where? In the colon. In the colon, right? Mostly in the colon. And then with Crohn's disease, it's going to be much more diffuse, right? It can kind of happen throughout uh, the GI tract and can include the colon, but certainly you're going to get these kind of skip lesions that happen kind of throughout. And that's going to be important on deciding what type of meds we're going to use uh, because we'll see that depending on the dosage form and how you administer some of these meds, uh, they will be able to target different sites in the GI tract. So um, the main problem with both of these disease states is kind of an overactive immune system. So our body is unable to differentiate self from uh, foreign uh, you know, invaders. And so we end up having some uh, overactive inflammation within the GI tract, right? So we see lots of other issues where uh, also with the GI tract being such kind of a dirty area, you have a lot of GI flora there that can also influence this inf uh, inflammation as well. So uh, primarily you see things like a leaky epithelial barrier. You have this kind of um, disturbed innate immunity within the mucosal epithelium. Um, all these things are helping to influence, um, you know, like these antigen presenting cells and the T cells are going to be uh, over, over uh, active. And so based on this, what type of drugs do you think we're going to use to treat this? If you had a guess. Immune modulators. Hmm? Immune, immune modulators. Immune modulators. Steroids. Steroids, right. So anti-inflammatories are really the big things. So we're going to be targeting uh, the inflammation cascade at several sites. Uh, so all those answers are, are correct from that standpoint. So, um, again, when we say ulcerative colitis, primarily that inflammation is confined to the mucosa within the rectum and the colon. Uh, so we're going to see that you can use some more targeted medications depending on kind of how extensive uh, the inflammation is uh, for that area, since it is a little bit more kind of in the terminal GI tract. Um, you'll see that with Crohn's disease, because it is much more diffuse, you're going to see medications um, that are used are going to be more from the oral route, right? So um, if you're thinking like something like an enema, uh, if you were to give an enema, how far up uh, do you think that travels? Hmm? So it probably doesn't really get past um, the splenic flexure, right? Uh, so it doesn't really get that far up. And so we're going to see kind of where the cut point is for that. Um, certainly for like a proctitis or something or kind of a, uh, you know, um, and on the terminal end of things, uh, an enema is going to be great for that, right? It's going to be able to cover all that. But if it, things start to get more diffuse than that, it start to travel up further up the colon uh, and the small intestine, you're going to see that things like oral medications or IV medications are going to be much better for targeting those type of areas. But obviously, one of the bad things we can see is things like you know bowel perforations and, and uh, translocation of GI uh, flora can be a problem. So infection can be a big issue here as well. And of course, anytime you have anti-inflammatories on board, what do you run the risk of? Ulcers, huh? Well, yeah, so you can see J ulcers on the corticosteroids. Depress the immune system. You're inhibiting inflammation. Secondary infections, absolutely. So infections are going to be a big thing um, you're worried about, especially when you have all these kind of nasty GI bugs that can potentially um, have a little bit easier time getting into the systemic circulation because we know that they're, the you know, GI mucosa is so inflamed and it's so, um, you know, it's going to be more leaky, right? So um, how are we going to be treating this? We're going to see that there's a couple of different therapeutic options. Um, certainly things like nutritional support and surgery can be uh, used in these cases. I won't really be touching on those so much, um, but we're going to see that for ulcerative colitis, you can use things. And when I say topical, this doesn't really mean like you're applying it to the skin. This means topical, meaning you're applying it um, generally uh, PR or per rectum uh, for kind of more topical application to the inside of the colon, right? So when I say topical, that's kind of what I mean uh, to differentiate from oral versus IV. Okay, so obviously oral things are going to be able to affect the entire GI tract. Things that are more topical are going to be more um, kind of more in the terminal uh, GI tract. 
mostly see things like immunosuppressants. We're going to have a couple of drugs that are working specifically to inhibit the actions of TNF-alpha. So that's where we get some of our monoclonal antibodies like infliximab and uh, adalimumab. <laughs> Uh, and then we'll see some probiotics can be useful here as well. Uh, and then with Crohn's disease, typically you're going to see the same type of therapies being used. Uh, for the most part, you're not really going to use topical therapies uh, because, again, it is so diffuse. Um, but here you might also see some use for things like antibiotics. Uh, it could be some issues of, you know, uh, small intestine bowel overgrowth. Um, so there's some uh, ro role for antibiotics there and then also some antidiarrheals potentially. Okay. So um, our goals here are to resolve the inflammatory process, so try to knock down the inf inflammation there, um, resolve any kind of uh, complications that can happen. So if there are fistulas or if there are abscesses, hopefully by decreasing the inflammation, you kind of give that time uh, for those kind of areas of damage to heal. Uh, and if we can alleviate any kind of extra intestinal manifestations, right? So in a lot of cases, you won't see the inflammation just being relegated strictly to the GI tract. There can be some extra, uh, extra GI manifestations there you want to deal with. And then... Um, you will see that in some cases, more mild to moderate disease, there could be some kind of self-resolution there, um, you know, without any real intervention. But certainly for more moderate, severe cases, um, you may see patients require kind of indefinite therapy, right? So you may have patients with more mild disease that could use, you know, maybe um, just for flare-ups or for exacerbations, they might need some, some therapy. But some patients may need to be treated for life, right, depending on how bad their inflammation is. So um, first uh, group of drugs we're going to look at are going to be these anti-inflammatories, um, the amino salicylates. So if you imagine um, talking about contraindications, what type of patients do you think would be contraindicated from receiving a drug like called an amino salicylate? Yeah, post-viral kids, right? So kids less than 16 because you worry about that Rye syndrome. Um, but sulfasalazine is going to be the, the first one we see here. This one is a prodrug, uh, meaning, so what is it? When I say prodrug, what does that mean? So it's not, necessarily, it's not always the liver turns it on, it's usually the liver turns it on, but the active form is not necessarily active, right? Or the, the, the parent form is not active, I should say. Um, it has to get activated. So here, what you see with sulfasalazine is it actually gets uh, broken down into sulfapyridine and then it's 5 amino salicylate, um, otherwise known as mesalamine. So mesalamine is another drug we'll look at in just a minute. Um, this actually gets metabolized by colonic bacteria. So the bacteria there can be um, used to help kind of uh, catalyze that reaction to, to break apart that drug and allow it to be active. And as we know, um, salicylates are going to be good anti-inflammatories because they have activity to inhibit cyclooxygenase. So that's going to have one activity there. And then the sulfapyridine itself will have some anti-inflammatory actions as well. So kind of um, you get two drugs for the price of one, so to speak, uh, to have some activity there. Um, this one does not get used as much. We'll see that mesalamine is probably going to be a much more uh, frequently used drug. And this is really due to side effects. Um, due to the kind of the, the sulfapyridine there, you can see issues um, with you know rash, you see blood dyscrasia is associated with that, so things like thrombocytopenia and whatnot. Um, so because of that, it's not as well tolerated, something like mesalamine. So, um, but this was kind of one of the earlier ones that we had uh, in order to treat some of these conditions. Would this also be contraindicated for patients who are allergic to sulfur drugs? That would be a consideration. You know, there might be some cross-reactivity there. Um, actually, when you look at the, the actual literature, when they say patients who have a sulfa allergy, it's really to the sulfa antibiotics thing like, you know, uh, sulfamethoxazole, what they find is that there's not a ton of actual um, cross-reactivity with other drugs that just happen to have a sulfa moiety. There, there could be some risk for cross-reactivity there, but that would be a concern you want to, to at least, you know, screen the patient for and um, see if they can tolerate it. You know, again, always check to see what the actual reaction was. If it was like, oh, I had diarrhea when I took Bactrim. Doesn't, well, that's not really an allergy, right? Is that why we're seeing a rash in this? Yeah, it's really back to that sulfapyridine. Yeah, similar to what you would see with the Bactrim, right? Um, so again, it's not really an antibiotic, but there could be some, some reaction there. So um, next we have mesalamine or 5-amino salicylate. Um, this one is going to be reducing inflammation due to inhibition of cyclooxygenase. So um, it's also going to be affecting some degree of lipoxygenase and maybe some other anti-inflammatory mechanisms there. Um, but the nice thing is because there's no sulfapyridine, you see less adverse effects uh, than sulfasalazine by itself. And so uh, basically, this is designed, a lot of the different products are designed to deliver the mesalamine to the colon, uh, where it's not actively going to be absorbed. So you get kind of nice local action. You don't see a ton of systemic absorption of the drug, which limits a lot of those systemic side effects as well. Okay, Lots of different varieties of mesalamine products that are out there. So I just list a few here just to kind of show you some examples. Um, you don't have to memorize the dosing or, or anything like that. But just be aware of, you know, if I said you had a patient who was having um, issues of Crohn's disease, you know, what might be the best option for them, right? Or if they just have like a terminal proctitis, like what might be um, the best options for them? And so that goes back to the dosage forms that we're going to use. 
So certainly you have uh, tablet formulations. Uh, some of these are going to be delayed release. Um, so that way they have a higher amount of it that will be uh, active once it gets to the colon. Um, you can see some of these are going to be uh, in a um, enema formulation. Some of them are going to be a suppository. So certainly something like a suppository, how far um, do you think the drug gets in that situation? Not very far, right? Because you're not. There's no actual like kind of propulsion to get it up there. You're right? basically just sticking directly in the rectum and having direct actions right there. Versus something like an enema, when you apply that, there's usually some degree of force to it. It's a liquid. Um, you're able to kind of send it further up into the colon and get kind of uh, more more. Um, diffuse action there. So I'll show you an example of that, kind of what that looks like in the graph in just a second. Um, just be aware of uh, the, the differences here and when you might choose, say, a tablet versus something like an enema. So here's an example of looking at the different um, mesalamine products and seeing kind of where it's going to be working at uh, within the GI tract, right? So if you think about something like Pentassa, that probably is going to be good for someone with like Crohn's disease, right? Because that's going to be much, much more diffuse throughout the GI tract. Something who's only having uh, a proctitis, uh, you know, something like the mesalamine suppository is going to be better for them, okay? So think about that. Think about how diffuse the disease is and, and where they actually need to get the drug to uh, when you're selecting your product. Uh, you may see some patients who will be on combinations. So you may see some patients on tablets plus uh, an enema. That's not uh, completely unheard of. It just depends on how their, their disease is presenting. A couple other varieties uh, in, in the aminosulcylates that we can use include osalazine and basalazide. Um, just be aware there's other drugs that are out there. Again, some of these are going to be pro-drugs that get converted by the colonic bacteria. Um, but they're all going to have pretty similar activity for the most part. But usually in the salamine is probably the, the main go-to that's being used most frequently nowadays. Other things that we can use include corticosteroids. Um, what are some problems with using corticosteroids for patients? Say like an oral or IV administered corticosteroid. About looking at the slide. Mm -hmm. Long term side effects. Such as what type of side effects? All right, so you worry about immunosuppression, so you can see secondary infections, especially if they have other immunosuppressants on board. So you worry about infections, possibly fungal infections, could be bacterial, viral, any kind of thing can, can pop up there. Waking can be one, right? So you see adrenal suppression, you can see osteoporosis, and and uh, especially postmenopausal women. Like think about all these side effects that are associated with corticosteroids, because again, they're going to pop up every single place you use corticosteroids. So these are good ones to to keep in mind, uh, especially when you're doing anything with rheumatology. Um, you know, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to use these much more commonly. But um, the the benefit here with um, inflammatory bowel diseases, you can get away with using um, some products that are working more locally, all right? So you can limit some of those systemic side effects you can see. Um, so frequently, uh, patients will use topical hydrocortisone. So these are either given, uh, mostly often being given by an enema. Um, so you can see like uh, Colacort or, or Anusol, Cortifoam, which is actually like a, a foam product uh, that will develop, uh, that will, you know, kind of is a liquid in, in the actual package when you spray it out. It's actual foam that will kind of have better um, staying power uh, in that standpoint. So the benefit of using hydrocortisone locally, just there on the on the mucosal tissue, is you get kind of nice action directly at the site. You don't see a ton of systemic absorption. You can certainly see some, but not, not nearly as much as you would see with like an oral product. Um, one of the other things uh, that we can use uh, to bypass some of the systemic effects is going to be budesonide. Do you guys remember where we saw budesonide previously? It was asthma, yeah. Budesonide is a frequently used uh, inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, it's a pulmicort. You can see it being used there. Um, we can use it here as well. The nice thing with budesonide is that it has extensive first pass metabolism, so very little systemic effects associated with it. Uh, by giving it orally, you can get, again get kind of that nice local side of action within the GI tract without seeing a lot of systemic side effects. Okay. So those are some benefits uh, to using things that are going to limit that systemic uh, effects. Um, but for patients who are having very severe flare-up of symptoms or those that are, um, say, for instance, having extra GI tract man manifestations, that's when we need to go looking more at, at systemic therapy, right? So this is where you need to use things like uh, prednisone, uh, methylprednisolone. Methylprednisolone, you can see either orally or, say, given IV potentially. Um, so those are the main places you're going to see those being used for those disease flare-ups. Um, 
that's for the most of it, right? So you certainly for chronic therapy, you can see the topical products like hydrocortisone, budesonide being used, but for flare-ups uh, and for those acute exacerbations, that's where you're going to use more systemic therapy, right? Because we don't want a lot of these chronic side effects developing for these patients long-term, right? So for some things like rheumatoid arthritis, you can certainly see patients who might be on, say, low-dose prednisone every single day, but for here, there's really no role for chronic uh, systemic therapy uh, unless they have very, very difficult to control disease, or it, it would be odd you would see that just due to the side effect profile. Does that make sense? So if you were to say, you know, what type of uh, corticosteroid product would be best for your patient with ulcerative colitis uh, for chronic maintenance of therapy, um, you know, you would not pick the oral prednisone, right? Because, you know, there's going to be too much systemic side effects, but, you know, oral budesonide or topical hydrocortisone, they're going to be the best options there. Okay. Make sense? All right. So uh, moving on, then there are some uh, immunomodulators here, immunosuppressants that we can use to help limit the inflammatory actions uh, of the body. So a couple of uh, options here. We have the thiopurines. Um, these are going to be similar um, to drugs we've seen previously. So do you guys remember where we saw 6 mercaptopurine before? Cancer. Yep, used for cancer, right? Um, azathioprine, have we talked about that one before? I'm not sure if we have. Probably not. That one you can see used more for things like transplant uh, or prevention of rejection after you know things like solid organ uh, transplant. So all of these drugs are working to limit the uh, kind of replication of those fast dividing immune cells, right? So uh, your white blood cell count is going to be taking a hit here, but that's kind of what we're, what we're shooting for. Typically, the doses for these you know, drugs, if you see them used in cancer, the doses are typically going to be higher or lower, do you think, than for like a rheumatoid condition? Typically a lot higher, right? Because if you're using it for something like uh, leukemia, like you want to knock out all of those white blood cells, right? Or at least a significant amount of them. Uh, They're hopefully all the cancerous ones. Here you're typically using lower doses. You're going to see less side effects in general, but that's not to say you won't see any. So big options here uh, include uh, azathioprine, 6 mercaptopurine. In general, when you're using these immunosuppressants, uh, they take time to work. You'll see this uh, occur in, in rheumatoid arthritis as well, where uh, it takes three to six months to really see full effects here, right? They're not going to have, uh, you know, kind of acute effects like you would see something like, you know, a corticosteroid or something like uh, a mesalamine. It's going to take time for these really to kick in. Um, remember how they're working? They're working to basically inhibit the production of new DNA, uh, basically by kind of mimicking making purines uh, that are normally incorporated into DNA. They kind of halt DNA uh, re replication and prevent those immune cells from, from rapidly dividing. So because of that, what other types of side effects do you think you might see with these guys? What other rapidly dividing cells could it take a hit on? Hair. The hair, potentially alopecia, right? Probably don't see this as much as you see like with methotrexate or something, but that's one risk. What else? Hmm? Yep, so the GI tract takes a hit as, as well in general. So, uh, again, you can worry about nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which these guys are already having issues with. Uh, you worry about that stomatitis that can, can happen there. Um, again, hopefully fewer symptoms here, fewer side effects because of the fact you're using lower doses, but still a possibility when you worry about it. And then secondary infections are always going to be a risk, okay? So other options you have there as well include cyclosporin or Nero. This one is working by inhibiting um, interleukin-2, uh, which helps to limit T-cell activation. Um, this one is frequently used for um, after transplant as well. So that's another place you might see cyclosporin being used. Um, adverse effects here include things like nephrotoxicity, so make sure you're monitoring the re renal function, um, can worsen hypertension, and again, secondary infections can be a problem here as well. Okay. And then you have methotrexate, um, which is kind of a standard go-to kind of rheumatoid uh, arthritis kind of drug. Here you can see it being used uh, frequently. Um, again, same side effects as you see with some of these other ones. Probably a little bit more severe as far as like alopecia and, and myelosuppression and things like that. And again, usually the um, doses are going to be smaller than you see with cancer therapy. You know, for instance, here methotrexate can be given, say, once weekly, right? Uh, usually as, as an IM injection or something, as opposed to receiving, say, every day or receiving a lot of higher doses. Do you guys remember what type of drug you should give to help prevent some of the side effects of methotrexate? Hmm? It's a vitamin. Yeah, folic acid. Yeah, folic acid you want to give um, to help kind of prevent some of those kind of chronic um, things like neuropathies and whatnot. Um, again, if you had a patient who had accidentally taken too much methotrexate, um, I'd actually had a patient who was um, who would call the poison center. They were self-treating. Uh, I believe they had rheumatoid arthritis, and they were giving themselves injections um, once weekly of methotrexate. She had forgotten she had already given herself one for that week and accidentally got a second dose of it. Um, so we ended up using a different drug. Do you guys remember what that, that other one we use is? The activated form of folic acid? It's folinic acid, otherwise known as 
Lucavorin. Yeah, so Lucavorin and Phalanic Acids, uh, two names for the same thing. Um, that one you're giving because, again, methotrexate is working by... Yeah, exactly. So it inhibits folic acid from being used to produce a lot of those um, purines uh, to incorporate into DNA, right? So by inhibiting that process, you have to give the active form in order to counteract that. But for you know those patients who are on this chronically, you can give folic acid to kind of help supplement uh, those healthy cells that are not really being targeted by the, the methotrexate, okay? So again, keep in mind, these are not really laser targeted kind of drugs. These are affecting the entire spectrum of the immune system. We're gonna look at a few though. They're gonna be a little bit more directly targeted um, that will have a little have a very potent effect at in, inhibiting the inflammatory system, but are also gonna have a lot less systemic side effects because it is so laser focused. And this is where we get into our monoclonal antibodies. Um, so you guys remember these are products uh, that are made. Sometimes uh, you'll see monoclonal antibodies being produced from animals where you actually can hyperimmunize uh, animals like sheep uh, to produce an antibody. That's how we have the digoxin uh, immune fab, that's where we get that from. Um, these ones uh, you'll see are, are recombinantly made, so things like infliximab uh, is going to be uh, an antibody that is produced against uh, TNF, or tumor necrosis factor, right? So specifically, anytime it encounters TNF, it's going to bind that up and prevent it from being uh, active again, okay? So uh, adalimumab is going to do the same thing, bind to TNF alpha, okay? So and you know it's a monoclonal antibody because? As it may be at the end, absolutely. So if you know anything from farm, you'll probably know that at least. Um, so uh, these drugs are, what do you think the cost is for these drugs versus something like methotrexate? Mucho expensive, right? So again, um, how you decide to treat these patients, a lot of it can come down to what's their insurance coverage, right? They can't afford a drug, they're not going to take it. You know, for instance, uh, for some of our patients uh, with um, our GI guys over at Nemours, we were previously giving these kids uh, Remicade or Infliximab for a lot of our, you know, UC Crohn's disease uh, patients. Um, but then we had the uh, manufacturers who make Humira came in and they actually had a program where you can get the first dose for free within the hospital. You know, so say if you come in for a first exacerbation, you get diagnosed, you get that first dose for free and then they'll actually have people that will work with the patients, uh, work with their insurances to get them covered so they can get chronic therapy outside of the hospital, right? So it's kind of a win-win situation. Patient gets, a, a, you know, their first dose for free. The hospital doesn't have to pay for that. Um, you know, there's some ethical implications there. Who knows, but that's what the RGI docs wanted to go with. Um, so they switched over and that's kind of our primary drug that we use uh, for a lot of those kids, all right? So, um, and again, uh, you'll see that the dosing is, is fairly different between these two. So something like infliximab is infused, say, at week zero, at week two, at week six, and then you can kind of start backing it up to, like, say, every eight weeks or so, right? And so this is an actual infusion that patients have to come in and get, right? So they come into the infusion center or the clinic or wherever and get an infusion of, of their of their Remicade. Um, the benefit for something like Humira is it uh, comes in pens, and so the patient can actually administer it to themselves subcutaneously. So that's one benefit uh, that might be useful for your patients. Um, we'll look at these drugs again. We talk about RA, but if you imagine um, RA patients, you know, what's one of the big problems with, with them in their hands? They might have yeah, difficulty with dexterity, right? And so like maybe a pen might not be a good option for them, right? So you'll think about these things like what are the disease manifestations and how can it affect the dosage forms you use? Um, that'll be something we'll talk about when we get to, to rheumatoid arthritis. But um, here it could be a good option for your patients who, you know, say especially if they're younger, if they have no problem with, with dexterity, they can administer themselves a pen no problem, okay? Um, big uh, risk that you're gonna see with the monoclonal antibodies. What are some side effects you worry about? Yep, so uh, allergic reactions, because you're injecting a foreign protein into the body. Um, if you had to guess which one has more reactions associated with it, what, what do you think? You have a 50-50 chance. Humira. Think Remic Humira? Actually, it is going to be the, the Remicade. Remicade actually has a little bit more. The reason for that is is because the uh, infliximab actually has more chimeric uh, proteins associated with it. I mean, it's going to be more human and murine protein, murine being mouse protein, right? So it actually has some mouse protein in there. Um, so if they want some cheese afterwards, that's okay. Just, <laughs> just indulge them. Um, but because of that, because that's a little bit more for, foreign uh, proteins associated with it, it's going to have a little bit more risk for reactions, right? Which is probably an okay thing because, again, they're going to be getting this like in an in infusion center where you can monitor them for, for adverse effects. Um, this is one of those things where you're infusing it over the course of like two hours or so. So you have to start at a little, really low rate, see how they respond to it. If they're doing okay, then you can kind of gently ramp up the dose to get it in over a full two hours. First, of the, the Humira, you just basically do a, a one-time injection and then you're good, right? Um, still some risk, you know, injection site reactions that can happen there, but just be aware of kind of those nuances that you'll, you'll learn if you work with these patients frequently. 
other big side effects you worry about. I'm inhibiting TNF alpha. So I'm decreasing the the ability for that that. So you can have tumors of cancer. Um, you do worry about some secondary malignancy. There is some concern there. I don't think it's probably going to be enough to where you would not want to treat those patients, especially if they were at a point where they needed one. And we'll talk about the kind of the algorithm and how you get down to choosing to use one of these drugs. But yeah, secondary malignancy can be a, a potential risk. What's something I want to check my patient for before I start them on this drug? I heard it. Two letters. TB. Right. So because of the risk that patients may have a latent TB infection, this can reactivate when you end up inhibiting TNF alpha. So with any of the monoclonal antibodies, and we'll see this with uh, even wider array when we get to RA. Um, but when you're treating with these drugs, you want to check a PPD beforehand. Right. Because they have a latent infection, you worry about activation of that. OK. <laughs> So uh, consider that. Make sure a patient doesn't have TB. Um, other things you can see potentially are increasing risk, or increasing uh, kind of worsening of CHF. Don't really know the mechanism for that one, but uh, some patients, especially with say you know grade three or four CHF, may have a worsening of their symptoms there. May have some extra fluid overload and, and things like that. So just be aware. Make sure you're monitoring for that uh, as you go on. Okay. So um, other therapies that we can potentially use uh, are going to be probiotics. So these are going to be live non-pathogenic bacteria. Um, these probably don't have as much kind of good evidence behind their use as you would see with something like uh, some more monoclonal antibodies or the other kind of um, you know, immunosuppressants uh, there. Um, there's lots of different varieties that you can see there. So you can see certain uh, E. coli strains, lactobacillus is probably a very common one. Um, the sarcomyces is another very common one. Certainly you can get this from things like yogurt and, and whatnot. Um, may help uh, for some of these patients, may help kind of to regulate the, the GI flora. Um, but again, it's may probably not going to have a whole lot of negative effects. So again, if patients want to use this as, an, as another option, that could be okay for them. If they're having kind of excessive diarrhea, things like that, maybe a decent option for them as well to try to help kind of regulate that somewhat, right? So um, looking at antibiotics, some of the possible benefits you can see with using antibiotics for these patients. Um, one, if you can decrease the concentration of bacteria in the gut, um, that may be useful for inhibiting kind of how much inflammation your body's trying to mount against those bacteria. Um, it may help to increase uh, some beneficial bacteria, right? So if you kind of get rid of ones, maybe more kind of disease causing, maybe you can uh, try to, to restore normal flora, especially if you're using it with probiotics or something. Um, and then you see hopefully less of the systemic dissemination in this bacterial tissue invasion, right? So hopefully we're gonna see less systemic uh, uh, infections if we can kind of eliminate some of these more uh, pathogenic ones. Some of the risks, um, there's not as much evidence to support use uh, in these cases. And then you also worry about increasing the risk for resistant bacteria, right? So I keep hammering and giving these patients chronic antibiotics, or you're going to get resistant to bugs at some point. It's just, just how, how these bugs work. Um, so where you're frequently going to see it being used is not going to be for every patient, but for the ones that are going to benefit most from this are going to be those that have fistulas uh, and Crohn's disease. Really, this is kind of the only place that is really recommended at this point. Um, main ones you're going to see being used are going to have activity against you know, gram negatives, uh, some you know, anaerobic bugs, so things like ciprofloxacin is a good option here. Metronidazole are probably going to be your go-tos. Okay. Um, other options you may see being used uh, potentially include things like tetracycline, chlorothromycin, uh, rifaximin, which is actually a derivative of rifampin, uh, kind of falls in that category. But usually, you know, Cipro or, or metronidazole are going to be your kind of go-to drugs in these situations. That would be one strategy to try to select out for those, you know, those, those good bacteria, so to speak. Um, the idea being that like something like Cipro or Flagyl are kind of getting rid of more of those ones that are known to be pathogenic. You're right, it's not super selective, um, but that's why what, what it's a theoretical benefit, not necessarily something we have a ton of evidence to support the, the use of, right? But if you know they have a fistula, you know they're having you know this kind of site where all these bacteria are just growing, and you know there's going to be increased risk for that, that translocation of bacteria, like it's just better just to try to get rid of those. Yeah. So um, looking specifically at how we're going to use, now we know the drugs that we're going to use. Uh, we know what is in our armamentarium. How, how can we uh, use it specifically for these different disease states? So uh, with UC, uh, the goals we're going to have here are to try to have remission of their symptoms and, and try to decrease that mucosal inflammation. And hopefully we can uh, maintain remission and then improve quality of life, right? 
Uh, I don't know if it, has anyone ever dealt with someone who has UC or Crohn's disease, but it's a very, very debilitating condition. It's very, very, um, very hard on them, especially if they have, you know, uh, not really good control of their symptoms. So um, quality of life takes a major hit with these disease states. So if we can do anything to improve that, it's going to be good for them. Um, and so you're going to see that the treatment is going to be dependent on the severity and location of disease. Okay. With Crohn's disease, location is not really going to be so important because we know it's diffuse. With UC, this is going to be more important here. So, for instance, uh, if you were to have simply a proctitis, <coughs> you might lose your point around. Um, what type of dosage forms do you think we could use here? Yeah. Suppositories, enemas, and you could use tablets too, right? So you could use systemic therapy with, with a tablet or something. That would be totally okay, right? Um, how about something if we were just having like kind of a left-sided colitis? Probably uh, no suppositories here, right? Because suppositories are really going to be kind of limited right here to the rectum. Um, enemas, though, certainly, yes, you could probably get uh, some efficacy here, okay? On the other hand, if it's going to be much more diffuse than that, what do we need to use? All oral, right? So it's not to say that, especially uh, for some patients, they may benefit from having, um, you know, enema therapy plus oral therapy. Um, that way you're kind of getting it from, from both sides, so to speak. Um, that can be beneficial for some patients. So you may see that um, it's not necessarily a therapeutic duplication. It could be uh, with, with intention. So um, this is easier than it looks. <laughs> It's a little intensive, right? Um, but essentially what you're looking at is, is stepwise therapy, right? And so we talked about the things that kind of are more associated with more systemic side effects. And so we're going to try to limit use of those drugs as, as best as we can, right? Um, so, and ideally, you're looking at kind of the, the severity of disease to see kind of where you're starting at uh, along the, the spectrum, right? So the, the drugs are going to have the fewest side effects. Uh, and they're going to have, um, you know, probably more limited efficacy compared to some other drugs are going to include like our amino uh, salicylic acid products, right? So this is where you can see with more mild to moderate disease, this is where we can get away with using things like the sulfasalazine. Looking up right here, looking at the sulfasalazine, looking at uh, mesalamine being used here. Um, Keep in mind the dosage forms, right? Based on whether or not we're just having kind of more distal uh, issues or we're having more of a kind of a full um, pan colonic kind of, kind of manifestations here, right? Um, Notice as we get to more severe disease, um, this is where we're going to start to see the incorporation of things like our uh, corticosteroids, right? So this is where you can see things like prednisone being used daily. Um, this is where you can see thing, things like hydrocortisone being used for those kind of more severe flare-ups, right? Uh, that's where those can be uh, most useful in those situations. Um, notice here when you're using um, you know, more mild disease, you can get away with things like budesonide, right? Or you can use things like corticosteroid enemas, depending on kind of where the disease is manifesting, right? So think about that. Think about using kind of more of those uh, limited systemic therapies as much as you can. Uh, if patients do not have adequate response to these kind of therapies alone, so topical corticosteroids or um, or the, the salicylic acid products by themselves, that's when you want to consider adding on some of those immunomodulators, right? This is where we consider adding on things like azathioprine or mercaptopurine, okay? Usually patients are having a little bit more severe manifestations. That's where you want to jump more towards using the monoclonal antibodies, just because those are going to be uh, more expensive um, because of some of those kind of uh, side effects you worry about, especially in the more kind of chronic uh, term. Um, you know, for more kind of limited disease, maybe something like an azathioprine or mercaptopurine is going to be okay for them. Okay, but keep in mind those drugs take time to work, so you may need to help keep them controlled with some of your other therapies like the uh, more systemic corticosteroids. Okay, so it's a stepwise approach. Don't just jump straight to Let's use Humira, right? There's other things that we can use before that. They're going to help to limit side effects and, and, and limit costs for these patients. Does that make sense? So if I said, you know, I had a patient who's coming in, they're known, uh, you know, known to have ulcerative colitis. Um, they normally take mesalamine uh, tablets uh, along with hydrocortisone foam uh, daily. Uh, they're coming in, they're now having, you know, kind of worsening symptoms, you know, severe diarrhea. Um, what kind of therapy do you want to start for them? So we're having an acute flare-up. So what do you want to do? Here might be. Okay. Yeah, so steroids are going to be your best option there, right? So for an acute flare-up, steroids are going to be your, your go-to. Uh, for very severe disease, IV is certainly a good option. Obviously, that's going to have the fastest onset of action. Um, oral is going to take a, a little bit longer. Um, but again, steroids, we talked about those in asthma. It takes time for those to work anyway, right? So um, again, that's our best option for acute flare-ups. But again, it's not going to be like an immediate, like, you know, just fix it like that. Um, 
So you can use those. And then for patients who have had problems where they're kind of failing those therapies, that's when you consider adding one of those immunomodulators. That's where you can consider your, your monoclonal antibodies, right? So it's going to be very patient dependent. You need to see what they've tried before, what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, and, and go forward from there. That makes sense? Looking at uh, Crohn's disease, you're going to see that the goals here are going to be very similar. Um, treatment is going to be less dependent on necessarily the location of disease, but it's going to be more based on the severity of the manifestations that they're experiencing. So uh, with here, what you're going to be seeing is, is very similar uh, therapy. Again, if you're concer uh, concerned about having kind of bacterial overgrowth, I cannot find my pin button. There we go. Um, you know, if you're concerned about bacterial overgrowth, like this is where things like the metronidazole or, or ciprofloxacin can be added on. Again, this is going to be more chronic therapy, so you do worry about um, you know, resistant bugs developing. So, you know, if you know you have a fistula, that's where you can um, utilize those agents. But otherwise, you're going to be using oral therapy, right? Because we're not going to be using enemas, we're not going to be using suppositories here because this is more diffuse throughout the GI tract. So, we need to use uh, oral sulfasalazine or mesalamine, something like that, right? Um, Again, if you're having more kind of moderate flare-ups, this is where you can utilize uh, more systemic kind of corticosteroids. Um, severe ones are going to require IV therapy, so just very similar to what we saw with ulcerative colitis. And then as they are failing therapy, as they are not really tolerating um, other things well, that's when you add on your immunomodulators. Very similar here. So it's a stepwise approach, um, kind of getting more severe. Now, for instance, um, can I utilize something like mesalamine along with, say, infliximab? Can I use those together? 100%, yeah. So you can, again, this is going to be something you're adding on medications to. Um, in some cases, you may even see patients who maybe are on like methotrexate plus infliximab for very severe disease. Um, so it's okay to mix things, um, you know, biologic with a non-biologic kind of uh, immunomodulator. Um, so just keep that in mind that you may see multiple therapies just depending on how treatment resistant they, they truly are, okay? But as you add more of those drugs on, more likely to see more um, immune suppression, more likely to see the secondary infection. So, so keep those risks in mind as well. Okay, so any questions on that? Yes? So with the immunomodulators, you said that they're, um, they're not good in the patients that have CHF and things like that? The, specifically the monoclonal antibodies, so like your infliximab and your adalimumab, um, those can worsen CHF. So if you had to add on something, what would you add on in that case? So I would probably start with something like a methotrexate or a, a azathioprine or cyclosporin, something like that. Um, depending on how they're tolerating it, right? So then, especially like with cyclosporin, like look at their kidney disease. Like, is that something that's, you know, influencing their CHF and, and whatnot? Um, so take all those factors into consideration. And then if they were still uncontrolled, they still were not able to tolerate those. So either due to toxicity or the drug just didn't work very well for them. Um, you can try adding on one of those, but you just need to monitor symptoms, right? They need to monitor for weight gain. They need to look for things like, you know, exertional dyspnea that's, you know, you know worse for them than what it normally was. Um, and it's really for stage three or four, CHF, right? So hopefully they don't have that bad of CHF and, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, but if they're unlucky enough, you just would monitor for symptoms and, you know, you may need to kind of tune up their medications a little bit, maybe give them an extra, you know, um, you know increase their dose of loop diuretic or something like that to help kind of tune them up a little bit. The theopurines, uh, is that going to help with gout? They have gout symptoms. They do not uh, inhibit gout. We'll talk about gout when we get to the kind of rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis section. Uh, for that one, um, you don't really see kind of any benefit on the production of uric acid from purines, right? Because we know that's a big source for, uh, a lot of that's coming from the diet and whatnot, where you see metabolism of purines into um, uric acid. Um, and we'll have drugs specifically that can inhibit that formation of, of uric acid uh, specifically. So that's going to be a much more effective site for fraction there. So you probably, you know, for someone who had kind of intermittent gout, you probably wouldn't want to give them like more captopurine. That'd probably be the toxicity profile is just not very good. Yeah, exactly. All right. So uh, for maintenance therapy, uh, basically, you know, the, the goal here is uh, maintenance of remission. Uh, hopefully we can avoid this flare-ups if we can. Um, again, all of these uh, drugs, you know, sulfasalazine, uh, the immunomodulators we talked about, like azathioprine, infliximab, uh, can all be utilized for, for ulcerative colitis. Um, you probably are going to see more use of methotrexate with Crohn's disease just because it is a little bit more diffuse and kind of more... Um, get a little bit more kind of uh, immunosuppression bang for your buck, so to speak, for methotrexate than you do for something like uh, azathioprine or 6-MP. Um, again, more side effects are going to go along with that too, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, also, antibiotics might be using Crohn's disease. Typically, don't see that in ulcerative colitis, okay? Um, corticosteroids really should have no role 
And when I mean corticosteroids, I mean like oral systemic corticosteroids really have no role in maintenance therapy, right? The idea is to get them off of their oral corticosteroids as best we can. Uh, you know, again, and, and if you are to have someone who had an acute exacerbation, so you're treating them uh, with, say, IV hydrocortisone, at what point do you need to worry about tapering their corticosteroids? How long do they have to receive, uh, say, systemic therapy before you have to worry about kind of tapering them off? Usually a week, right? So say five to seven days or so. That's when you need to start considering tapering them off, right? Because we worry about what are we trying to avoid? No. Well, when you are giving exogenous corticosteroids, what do your adrenal glands do? They shut down, right? They're like, hey, I don't have to do any work. We get a vacation here, right? So they're going to stop. If you do, uh, immediately discontinue those corticosteroids, it takes time for the adrenal glands to really start to kick back up, right? So that's why we do those tapers. And, you know, if it's only like five days of therapy, you probably don't need to worry about it, right? Uh, because it wasn't enough time to really shut down the adrenal glands. Uh, but in these cases, if you're treating a patient with, say, IV hydrocortisone for seven to ten days in order to try to uh, achieve remission, um, you need to taper them off of that, right? Because otherwise you worry about the adrenal suppression. Good. Um, and again, for most patients, unless the disease is very mild and they've had very few reoccurrences, lifelong therapy is probably going to be needed for this. Um, there's very few patients that can, can manage this without medications. Okay. So any questions on the inflammatory bowel disease? You're going to see that the therapies, um, that one probably has the most kind of nuances to therapy as far as dosage forms go, um, but a lot of those same principles are going to be popping back up when we talk about rheumatoid arthritis a little bit later on in the class. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay, um, so next we'll talk about irritable bowel syndrome here. Um, this is going to be a, a chronic condition that's going to be characterized um, by a lot of you know abdominal uh, pain, discomfort. Um, that's going to be associated with some change in bowel habits. So we're going to see there's going to be IBS with uh, diarrhea, IBS with constipation. There be kind of untyped you know, or mixed types of, of IBS. And so we're going to see that the, uh, the therapies we're going to use are going to be differing based on what their, their symptoms are, right? So someone who's ha having IBS with constipation uh, is not going to have the same therapy as someone with IBS with diarrhea because we're going to be using opposing drugs uh, at that point, okay? We do end up seeing a few more women being affected by this than the men, uh, so just keep that in mind for those patients. And, and that'll be important when we talk about specific drugs. Um, and certain drugs are only going to be uh, FDA approved for use in women and not in men. So we'll look at those as we go forward with those. So um, again, in a lot of cases, we don't know what the specific cause uh, for this is going to be. Some of it could be related to uh, inflammation. Some of it could be related back to you know some of this gastrointestinal uh, sensory motor dysfunction that's happening there, uh, causing some issues. Um, could be uh, dysregulation of 5-HT receptors, which would be important when we're talking about some of the drugs uh, that will target uh, serotonin receptors in some of those patients. And then there's a lot of psychologic factors that go along with this as well. You know, so some patients can have, they get stressed out, they can have exacerbations of this uh, that can be problematic for them. And then some patients may have a bacterial overgrowth affecting this as well. So we're going to see some role for antibiotics uh, if they do have a concern for bacterial overgrowth. So again, we said the, con uh, the different classifications. So there's IBS with constipation, some with diarrhea, there's mixed IBS. So we're going to see that you kind of treat based on what kind of what their symptoms are at the time. Uh, and there's an, an untyped uh, IBS that's going to be more associated with things like pain and bloating uh, without any kind of specific diarrhea or constipation associated with it. So uh, our goals here are to prevent or try to reduce their symptoms as much as we can, uh, improve uh, their understanding of IBS, maybe what their triggers are, so maybe they can help to avoid some of these episodes if they, if they are able to, and then improve quality of life. So um, obviously non-pharmacologic therapy education is going to be super important here. Um, they can keep a diet, as, or as far as diet goes, um, keep a diary to see kind of what their triggers are, see what kind of helps or worsens uh, their, their issues. Um, they try to avoid excesses, alcohol, caffeine, all those different things like that. Um, increasing fiber is always going to be a good option for them. So whether you have diarrhea or constipation, fiber is the way to go, right? So everyone should have more fiber in their diet probably. Um, Exercise can be helpful here, and then also some psychotherapy may be beneficial for some patients. So um, looking at the different uh, types of pharmacologic therapy here, this is going to make sense based on um, kind of what we've talked about previously as far as treatment of constipation, diarrhea go. So IBS with constipation, obviously bulk forming laxatives like our fibers and, and um, things like that, like methyl cellulose and psyllium husk are going to be very useful here um, because again, they can help to increase water content in the stool, help to kind of emulsify things and, and move it along. Um, osmotic laxatives, like what are some examples of those? 
yeah, Miralax or polythene glycols is probably going to be your go-to one from that category. It can be used for, uh, for there. And then we'll talk about uh, some new drugs, so things like lubiprostone. Um, we're going to talk about how our tricyclic antidepressants can be useful here, right? So again, TCAs can be used for pretty much anything, it seems like. Um, and then we'll have some serotonin uh, receptor modulators we'll see uh, as well. Um, with IBS with diarrhea, again, bulk formula laxatives can be useful here as well. And so uh, useful for diarrhea or constipation. And then we'll see some other uh, medications we can potentially use, some antidiarrheals. Um, we'll see the TCAs pop up again in a different uh, subtype of, of serotonin receptor antagonist, right? So here you can see the, the constipation, there's going to be a serotonin uh, receptor 4 partial agonist, and then with the other one, we'll have a 5-HT3 antagonist. So we can see some differences there as we go on. And then uh, specifically for the small bowel overgrowth, we're going to use that drug rifaximin. So it's a drug used, uh, it's a derivative of rifampin uh, to uh, treat some of the, that overgrowth there. So we'll, we'll talk more about those in detail as we move forward. All right, so we continue on discussing our bulk forming laxatives. So you guys know about these. Um, we talked about them already, but they're helping to kind of absorb more water, help to kind of encourage normal peristalsis, um, bowel motility. Um, obviously, what are some side effects you, you would see from these guys? Constipation? Not usually constipation. If anything, kind of help regulate things to hopefully prevent that. So you have this nice insoluble fiber. It's absorbing all this water. Uh, not dehydration. Hopefully, you're taking it with lots of water, right? That's the goal. Or you got to educate them to, to drink it with, with lots of water. You have all this increasing mass in, inside your, your stomach and... Hmm? Not impaction, just bloating, flatulence, like abdominal cramps, like just normal things. We're not talking about life-ending kind of side effects here always. Always, like sometimes it's just, you know, kind of minor inconveniences you may see. Um, so just, just be aware of that. So we have your, your psyllium husk, you have your meth, uh, methyl cellulose is the most common ones. Um, one that you may see sometimes uh, is... Uh, calcium polycarbophil. Uh, this has a little bit more evidence with IBS, um, so you may see that being uh, recommended for that if they, they don't want to use the other ones, uh, for instance. Um, our osmotic laxatives, again, uh, this helps to kind of increase the solute content within the GI tract, help draw water uh, and, and increase that, that urge to, to defecate. Um, so it's where you see the uh, magnesium hydroxide, uh, but probably the, the best go-to one here is going to be the polyethylene glycol. This one, um, you're not going to see as much incidence of like diarrhea and things uh, associated with that as you are with the magnesium hydroxide. Um, but other things you can certainly see include, you know, max citrate, sodium phosphate, um, lactulose, sorbitol, anything that's kind of hyperosmotic is going to draw water into the colon uh, to increase the or to defecate is going to be useful here. And so uh, one new drug we have here is this uh, chloride channel activator. So this is actually a prostaglandin uh, derivative. It's called lubiprostone or amatiza um, that increases the intestinal secretion uh, of fluids secondary to opening up these chloride channels. Okay, so it's able to open those up, increase secretion into the colon, uh, and increase that urge to defecate. So you might see this being used occasionally for patients with uh, IBS uh, with constipation to kind of help, help move things along. Um, the nice thing about this drug is it kind of works very uh, directly in the epithelia of the GI tract. It doesn't really get a whole lot of systemic absorption, so not a ton of, of systemic side effects other than just some minor, um, you know, kind of nausea that may be seen with it. Okay, so that's one option you may see with IBS with uh, with constipation. Do you want to come forward and to your seat? Your phone back there? Okay. I'll just give you the option. I'm not going to call you out for it. <laughs> Um, some other options that you could, uh, shame, shame, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> some other options uh, that you have available to you for IBS with constipation or diarrhea is going to be the, the tricyclic antidepressants. So we've seen lots of other uses uh, for TCAs or, or some other potential uses for TCAs we can see being other than depression. Pain. Yeah, neuropathic pain specifically, right? So sometimes you may see it being used for that. But um, we're not really sure uh, completely why this uh, actually may help with this. If anything, you would think, you know, especially with amitriptyline, some of the other agents, they have anticholinergic effects. If, if anything, what do you think that would do to the GI tract? Should slow it down, if anything, right? So anti-muscarinic effects, you know, you're taking away that kind of vagal, uh, um, parasympathetic uh, impulse. Uh, they normally should slow things down, but you do see some benefit for patients who maybe are not kind of responding to other uh, forms of therapy. Um, Again, you know, the side effects associated with the TCA is a lot of sedation associated with it, so I recommend taking it at nighttime. Um, sometimes you may see uh, SSRIs, things like, you know, fluoxetine or something being used, uh, less side effects associated with it, um, but it could be an, an option for those with uh, IBS with constipation. Um, you know, but again, this is usually kind of not first line therapy, usually second or third line where you might add this on. But again, it takes time to work. 
just like it is for depression. So maybe three to four weeks to really see what kind of the what kind of efficacy you might be uh, seeing there. Uh, some other new drugs we have here is going to be this 5-HT4 partial agonist. So this is going to be used uh, for IBS uh, with constipation. Um, and so the one we have here is Tegaserot or Zelnorm. Uh, and so this one, uh, by agonizing these uh, serotonin receptors, you're going to have uh, increased peristaltic reflex, hopefully increased uh, in, in defecation. And so... Um, Interestingly, uh, this one is only going to be used uh, for women because when they did the trials for it, they saw that they only had efficacy in women. And men, it was no better than placebo for whatever reason. Uh, so that's who it's going to be marketed for specifically. Um, now, there is some significant risk associated with it. So they worry about ischemic colitis uh, and other serious cases of diarrhea, right? So sometimes it works too well. And you can see some, some big issues there. So because of that, um, and also some small risk for cardiovascular events, uh, you can see there, and notice that p-value is significant or non-significant. Oh boy, Pull, pulling back from p-value. That would be significant, right? It's less than 0.05, right? So there was a significant increase in cardiovascular events. Um, this is actually going to be really, really limited to those that have failed every other form of therapy. So only for women uh, and only for those um, that are able to um, sign up with a special program in order to receive this, right? Because we know there's that increased risk for, for cardiovascular events and other, other GI conditions. So really only be reserved for those that have no previous cardiovascular disease, um, less than 55 years of age, you know, so it's very limited in who you use this to, uh, use this for, but um, just be aware that it's out there and you may see some patients who are refractory to other things using this. Uh, moving on to the antidiarrheals, we mentioned loperamide already. How does loperamide work? Be good to know for testing purposes. It's going to agonize those opioid receptors uh, peripherally in the GI tract, right? So by hitting those mu receptors in the GI tract, you don't uh, see a lot of euphoria or you know addiction and things like that. Um, but certainly, you can see. Um, Decrease in peristalsis, you see a kind of uh, opioid induced constipation. You see with a lot of other drugs, but here it's used as an antidiarrheal. So. Um, Notice that uh, in some cases it may be used um, as prophylaxis. It doesn't really deal with acute diarrhea quite so well, though. Um, some other drugs you may potentially be uh, used here as well, including uh, cholestyramine. Sometimes you can have patients who are um, refractory loperamide or if they maybe are uh, post-cholecystectomy related diarrhea, right? Why do you think they'd have that? So you've had your gallbladder taken out. Why might you have diarrhea associated with that? You're not digesting your lipids. Yeah, so less absorption and emulsification of those lipids. So more of them are going to be in the GI tract, um, more of them are going to be coming out. So you guys remember uh, Olestra? You guys remember those chips that were. Yeah. You remember? I guess I'm. You guys are too young for that. Um, there's some chips where they're using kind of an alternative um, form of oil, and it was uh, basically a non absorbed fat. Um, and so you saw a lot of diarrhea associated with that one because those fats were not getting absorbed. Um, but, you know, less calories, though, is great. You had to wear brown pants. Um, so, right. So, so be aware of patients who don't have a, a gallbladder. They're not going to be spitting out as much bile acids. Um, so those fats are going to have to stay somewhere. And so it's going to be in the GI tract. So cholestyramine, which you guys remember is a uh, bile acid sequestrant back from the hyperlipidemia section, uh, combine up those fats and, and hopefully limit that, that uh, uh, diarrhea. Uh, another drug you can use for IBS with uh, diarrhea is going to be this 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, and this is Elocitron. Um, this one is also going to be only relegated to females uh, who have severe IBS uh, with diarrhea. And so this one is also going to be restricted uh, for use because it can cause, again, work too well, cause severe constipation, uh, ischemic colitis, risk for death. Um, but again, if you're having uh, very severe diarrhea, this might be uh, kind of a balancing act you may want to, to look at. But um, Again, special programs that you sign up for to even use this one. So again, very rare that you would see someone actually on this. Um, but certainly educate them. You know, if you have you know new onset constipation, if you're having you know abnormal abdominal pain for you, um, get checked out. Like stop taking the med immediately and come get checked out because of these risks associated with it. These ones with these big risks and small like cohort for like. People, patients you would be training them with, are they more expensive as well? Or? Uh, I don't know the relative cost for these. They're probably more expensive because they don't sell a lot of it in order to kind of recoup their cost, if I had to guess. But again, it all depends if it goes off of, it gets more difficult when you have things that are like under these kind of special programs, because even if you, they come off patent, like a lot of people are not going to 
really chomping at the bit to really you know formalize generics and stuff like that. So there, I, I have to look up the cost to see what it actually is. But. And the 5-HT4, 5-HT3, those are serotonin, like analog sort of. They're, yeah, they're affecting the serotonin receptors, you know, so like we see with uh, this one, it's a 5-HT uh, antagonist versus when you have the constipation, you can agonize, you know, the partial agonists on those 5-HT4 receptors and, and stimulate defecation. Yeah. So um, some other antispasmodic agents uh, that can be useful, uh, especially if they're having a lot of cramping and, and, and things like that. Um, this helps to decrease the contraction of that smooth muscle, uh, hopefully decrease gastric secretion and, and motility. Um, we're going to see a big list of these, but they have uh, you know some side effects with them. Most of them are going to be anti-muscarinic in nature, right? So remember those side effects we talked about. You guys know the mnemonic for that. Um, but again, the dry mouth, the sedation, the, you know, um, uh, urinary retention, things like that you can potentially see with these. Um, these uh, antispasmodics really only needed, um, kind of use them as needed because you actually do end up seeing some tachyphylaxis associated with prolonged use. Do you guys remember what tachyphylaxis is? Start with nitroglycerin. Right, doesn't matter how much you ramp up your dose, you're never going to see increased effect for whatever reason, right? So whether you're depleting cofactors or some other reason for that, um, right? Because like with opioids, do you see tachyphylaxis? Not really. I can keep increasing my dose and still end up getting analgesia from that, right? So you don't see tachyphylaxis with that, but something like nitroglycerin, these agents, even when you get to a certain point, even if you keep increasing your dose, there's no uh, increase in effect, right? Or you may even see diminished effect uh, potentially depending on what kind of the mechanism is. So um, here's some uh, of the more common ones you're going to be seeing uh, being used. So they have things like hyoscyamine, um, dicyclamine. Um, these are good antispasmodic agents. So especially if you have, you know, I see this hyoscyamine being used frequently for patients who are coming in with a lot of abdominal pain and cramping and things like that. It kind of helps just relax those muscles uh, and kind of gives them some relief from that standpoint. Um, you know, you have some uh, uh, tablets, uh, especially the hyoscyamine or the Levson, uh, they'll have sublingual tablets that are able to be used, especially if they're having some nausea and vomiting associated with that, so that can be useful for them. Um, like a pyrrolate or robinol, that is uh, an anticholinergic that I will frequently see being used for um, hypersecretory kind of conditions. So patients have a lot of kind of um, uh, secretions of mucus and things like that can be very useful for them as well. So I see that a lot used for um, like trach patients uh, who are kind of producing a lot of mucus and kind of having uh, needing a lot of suction. Sometimes we'll actually give them um, some like a pyrrolate or robinol to help kind of dry them out a little bit. So lots of uses for these drugs uh, you may see, uh, see being used other than just for the, the antispasmodic actions. Right, because of the fact they're all anti-muscarinic drugs. Okay, um, so we mentioned some antibiotics may be useful for patients uh, who have a bacterial overgrowth uh, that is contributing to their uh, their IBS. So this is where you use rifaximin or zefaxin. Uh, this one is, again, I mentioned uh, similar in, in nature to rifampin. So we saw rifampin being used for things like endocarditis, uh, is it used for also like TB, things like that. Um, this one is not systemically absorbed, so it's going to be working strictly in the GI tract. Um, and it's going to be, as I mentioned, most useful for patients with that kind of uh, bacterial overgrowth. Um, maybe seeing some increased resistance as time goes on as it gets uh, potentially overused, but um, just be aware of that. There's actually one other place I've seen um, Rifaximin being used frequently, and that's for patients who have uh, hyperammonemia, especially related to like liver dysfunction. I've actually been able to see rifaximin actually able to help uh, um, lower ammonia levels uh, for some of those patients. So if you have like a, an ICU patient who's got a bad liver and they're kind of having an ultra mental status due to this hyperammonemia, this drug can actually help with that as well. So kind of one other use you might see it uh, being used for. So uh, basically, uh, the uh, way to go down this algorithm is basically to figure out kind of where they're at uh, as far as their type of, of IBS, whether it's constipation or more diarrhea. Um, obviously, for either one, you're going to be increasing their fiber, increasing, uh, you know, you can use those bulk forming laxatives, uh, can be useful for, for all of them. Again, education is really important here. If it's certain foods that are triggering you or certain, you know, um, stressors that are doing it, like try to avoid those as best you can. Um, for uh, the IBS with constipation, this is where you can start to use things like bulk forming laxatives can be useful for them. Uh, antispasmodic agents may be somewhat useful. Um, and then if they're still refractory to that for females who are at low cardiovascular risk, that's where you can consider using that tegacerod, right? 
on the other side, on the diarrhea side, um, this is where you can consider after you know your education in bulk forming laxatives, uh, your loperamide and other antispasmodics, uh, and then you can actually use a uh, serotonin three antagonist there, right? That elocitron, right? Again, only for females, only those that uh, are really at, at kind of low cardiovascular risk and 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 um, are kind of failed everything else. Okay, and then after that, they can consider looking at other things. Um, you know, anywhere along the spectrum, if they've kind of failed, you know, kind of the first line therapy, that's when you can consider using things like TCAs or SSRIs. Um, but just know this kind of plus or minus how much effect you're really going to get out of those. And you need to give them at least a th full three or four weeks to really see how, they're, how well they're going to work. Okay, so any questions on GI stuff? Yes. Um, the same same drugs will still work. You know, things like loperamide and whatnot. If you were trying to you know, use an as, as an antidiarrheal, those will still work. Yeah, no problem with those specifically. Um, do you guys want to hear about a cool case I had? Okay, so I was on call the other night. So just before we get into the test review, just because I figured it's a good avenue for that. Um, so you guys remember the drug digoxin? We talked about that last semester, right? Okay. Um, do you guys remember how that drug works? We do know, yeah, we do know how it works. Hmm? So it works by antagonizing the sodium, potassium, ATPase pump on the heart, right? We know that pump is really important for maintaining uh, the resting membrane potential for the myocytes, right? And so, uh, you know, you can use it for AFib, you can use it for CHF. Um, by inhibiting that pump, you increase intracellular concentrations of sodium, which will stimulate this pump to bring in more calcium. And we know calcium is really important for <laughs> Con contraction, right? So it's really important for contraction of the heart. So um, basically, I got a call. It was like midnight. Uh, I was on call for the poison center, uh, and they said, "Hey, we got this guy who um, he was at a nursing home. Uh, he was brought in. They thought he had uh, had an aspiration uh, pneumonia. They were initially you know, brought him to the ED. They're initially treating him for, and now um, his heart rate's in the 50s. Um, blood pressure is kind of marginal, uh, and the doc thinks it might be due to his digoxin." So uh, they went ahead and, and got the, you know, they said, I'd like to talk to the toxicologist. So they called me up. Uh, so I'm talking to the guy. And so essentially, um, you know, the dude comes in from the, the uh, assisted living facility. They're not sure if it was, he was taking it for AFib or, or CHF. Um, and so the guy's now bradycardic. He's in, in the heart rate in the 50s. Um, he's got renal dysfunction. Right, so that's an important thing to consider for digoxin because it's renally eliminated. Uh, his his uh, serum creatinine is 1.5. His BUN was like 50 or 60, something like that. Uh, and his potassium was elevated as well, right? Because anytime you're inhibiting that sodium potassium ATPase pump, normally it's shuttling potassium into the cell. When you inhibit that, now you're leaving an extracellular. So his potassium was elevated too, it was like 5.5. Okay. Um, so the question is, do you guys remember how to reverse the effects of the digoxin? Yeah, digifat, right? So you use the the immune uh, the uh, immune fab or the the antibody essentially um, that will bind all of that up and basically take it out of the equation because once it's bound up by the antibody, it's no longer pharmacologically active, right? So uh, the question was, well, should we use it for this guy? Okay, and so there's some indications that we have for deciding whether or not you're actually going to use uh, digibind uh, for one of these patients, right? Um, so some of the things you look at are like, okay, well, what's the heart doing? Okay, well, is he having hypotension related to cardiovascular instability, right? That could be one indication where you might do it because he's unstable at that point and you need to get his blood pressure back. Okay. Uh, other options uh, include if they're having any kind of uh, ventricular dysrhythmia or a really high degree AV block, right? So this guy was now having uh, on the rhythm, you know, his heart rate of 50, he was having a first degree AV block. Um, and so they, you always ask the question, well, what's new for him? Like, you know, is this, uh, what's his baseline? Does he have an AV block, a baseline, or is this something new for him? Um, same thing about the renal function. Like to ask, like, okay, well, you know, is he, is he dehydrated? And that's why his, his renal function is bumped. And that's why is that, you know, uh, Dijoxin levels are elevated or something like that. You know, so you have to ask a lot of questions about that. You also, you know, obviously they're in VTAC or VFib. That's not compatible with life. So you probably want to treat with the, the antibody at that point, right? Um, so you look for that really the life-threatening stuff. Um, the potassium level is also something we look at as well. So for um, what we've seen in the, the evidence, uh, the, the, you know, the previous trials we've seen out there is that elevated potassium levels are associated with the higher risk for arrhythmias, right? So if we see a, a, a potassium above 5.5, then we know that there are increased risk, right? So it's another potential indication uh, to treat with the, the immune fab. So and his digoxin level ended up coming back. It was 3.8, I believe. You guys remember therapeutic range at all? It's kind of high, right? It's like, it should be two, two and a half. 
you, it used to be like all the way up to like right nowadays it's like 0.8 to 1.2 typically um it used to be up to like 1.5 um back in the day but it's been lowered now um so so he definitely has an elevated jackson level he certainly has some degree of renal impairment i don't know if this is new or if it's chronic um and he's got elevated potassium right and he's bradycardic he's not hypotensive yet he's kind of he's kind of teetering but he's, he's fine now right um so the question is you know should we go ahead and give this drug so what do you guys think think so so the things you have to consider one where is he actually at in physically in the world right because when we take call for the poison center you know we're basically the jacksonville center takes care of the whole panhandle and basically kind of north central florida right so like just north of orlando uh is all the jacksonville uh center so you have to consider is he at um you know downtown baptist in, in jacksonville which is you know, a big teaching hospital right is he at the middle of podunk nowhere panhandle hospital where it's like the intensivist is like at his house and they call him in if they need him right so you have to consider what your monitoring um capabilities are right so this might be a guy where i'd say like well if your monitoring is really good and if he's going to the icu and you can watch him carefully maybe hold off right because the risk of giving the digibine and removing that effect of the digoxin is that you uncover whatever it's treating before so maybe worsening afib or worsening chf right so you're kind of balancing that and so in some cases if they're at a really poor monitoring uh or really poor ability to monitor you just say well screw it, let's just go ahead and give it. So that way you just take that out of the equation and just treat whatever else that happens um, as need be, right? This guy happened to be at a, um, a larger hospital. He was going to the ICU. Um, so we ended up saying, well, okay, so we don't have to worry about that from that standpoint. Um, but just because he was so kind of labile, um, you know, the doc ended up calling me back about an hour later and said his heart rate's now in the 140s. And what you'll see with the joxins, you can have bradyarrhythmias, tachydysrhythmias, everything in between. So he ended up deciding to go ahead and give it. Um, so he ended up dosing it based on the level uh, and his weight. And so he gave a certain number of vials uh, in order to help reverse that. So um, I didn't get any other calls about it. So I'm assuming he did okay. Uh, probably didn't keel over and die after that. So um that was my digoxin case that I had, but it's, it's interesting when you see it because, you know, a lot of people don't see it very frequently. So um, it's, you know, one of those things that it's nice to have some a little bit extra help if you can talk to, you know, the poison center or whoever about it if you're suspecting toxicity. So any questions on that? Probably not as interesting. It's more interesting to me than probably you guys, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we um uh not usually like so many, so binary is like oh they did fine or they didn't do fine but um yeah so all the cases that the uh, poison center has so they actually get to review so a part of my fellowship um, was every day we, after we got done rounding in the hospital we would go back and our um, our attending uh, and the fellows and then any rotators we had with us we actually reviewed all the active cases going on uh, for the center, right? So it's a lot of the hospital-based ones. Um, you know, it's not like, you know, like you got a Tylenol and you didn't do anything for them. Like those guys aren't following up on, but you know, the things we're following in-house, we would look at all those cases. And so they'd actually give feedback to um, all of the all the consultants and whatnot. They're like, okay, well, did you consider this instead, right? Maybe it wasn't a joxin toxicity, maybe it was something else going on, right? Um, especially for those unknown kind of cases. Like, oh, did you consider using this therapy instead? Or, you know, maybe it didn't meet indication for digibine, but you went ahead and did it anyway. You know, so they'll, they'll give you feedback on that kind of stuff, which is nice. It's all kind of peer reviewed. Um, so it's not just, you know, me making a decision in a vacuum, like, you know, I can help to incorporate other other opinions. Cool. Okay, um, so let's do some test review. So this is the first test. It's going to be a lot more of the same uh, as far as the type of questions I ask. Certainly there'll be a few that are like, what's the mechanism of this drug, right? So, but not a ton of those. It's going to be a lot more kind of clinical correlations and um, cases where you have to decide what to do uh, with a patient, right? Will you be posting this? Will I be posting this? Yes. Uh, yes, I will be posting this. You'll have access to this. Um, so uh, as far as behavioral meds go, so um, it's important to understand, again, how, how do these drugs work for depression? Increasing SS, how many serotonin or norepinephrine? Well, that's what we thought, but we even like if you give drugs that uh, directly increase that, like why does it take six weeks for these drugs to work? Probably because it's, we don't know. Precisely, we, don't, we have no idea why these drugs work. Okay. <laughs> However, we do know their mechanisms of action, which directly informs their toxicity, right? So it's important to understand the difference in toxicity between a TCA versus an MAOI versus an SSRI and an SNRI, right? Be aware of those things like dietary interactions that pop up. Be aware of things like uh, which ones have more anticholinergic activities, which ones are safer um, to use. Like, you know, um, you know, do you guys remember any SSRIs that have uh, cardiac effects? 
citalopram and acetalopram is that QT prolongation, right? So be aware of those kind of things. Those kind of one-off um, kind of side effects that pop up. They're important. Um, think about drug interactions, right? What's the big one you worry about with like monoamine oxidase inhibitors? Tyramine's a big one, right? So tyramine uh, gets converted over into things like norepinephrine and serotonin. So you want to watch out and avoid foods like that. Like what type of foods? Cheese. Aged cheeses, right? So it's not like craft singles or something. This is like you know your fancy bougie kind of cheese. Um, yeah. What other kind of things? Beer, red wine, dark chocolate. Every, yeah, all the good stuff in life, basically. So if, it's, if you love that kind of food, don't eat it. That's basically what they kind of tell you. So and again, that informed why we moved away from a lot of those drugs and using things like SSRIs, which in general are much safer uh, in regard to that. You know, it, it was interesting, you know, because um, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but my, my old boss at the Poison Center, he was saying that back in the day when TCAs were really your only option, you know, after the MAOIs, um, they'd have four beds set up in the, in the um, ED just for patients who had overdosed on their TCAs, right? Because again, this, when you start taking those meds, you get a little bit more energy and you can finally start acting on those thoughts of, of self-harm and then if you know four beds just would intubate patients getting bicarb drips from from tca ingestion right so very very bad from that standpoint which is why it's nice we have the ssris um sometimes i kind of regret being this late in the game because i kind of missed out on all these like really toxic drugs and feels like the wild west back in the day but uh it's better for your patients in, in general though um Good. So again, um, we said, you know, uh, serotonin syndrome versus like NMS. Where, where do you see neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Good. Antipsychotics. Which antipsychotics work how? Dopamine antagonism. Know your mechanisms, guys. Um, so by blocking dopamine, right, because that's why it almost like induces the Parkinson-like states because you're blocking dopamine. Um, but that's where you can see a lot of those movement disorders, like the acute dystonias. You see the EPS. You see the tardivis kinesia. What, what is EPS? Good. What are those? Yeah, the Parkinson. So what are some examples of Parkinson's? Like tremors, rigidity, shuffling gait, pill rolling, all those kind of things you're going to see there. Have you guys ever seen the movie Awakenings? With um, no Robert De Niro, is in it? It's a really good movie if you ever get to check that out. It's about um, them kind of coming up with the first kind of therapies for Parkinson's. We'll talk about that in the neurology section. Um, but when they actually first came up with like levodopa, carbidopa, and they were um, able to give these patients who were like catatonic, like actual some degree of function again, it was really kind of fascinating to, to watch that. So uh, I'd recommend that movie if you ever get a chance to watch it. Um, what's some of the problems with uh, St. John's Wort? Drug interactions, what does it do? It's a SIP, three, four, inducer. Yeah, it's, it's an inducer, right? So you end up cut, saw, seeing um, decreases in levels of some drugs, right? Uh, so think about those kind of interactions you might run into, right? Because then again, uh, you may have a patient who uh, decides, you know, they are self-treating for their own depression. And they say, hey, I heard that, that St. John's wort uh, works really well. I'm going to start taking that, right? Um, nothing wrong with that as long as they're having a conversation with you and you, you can kind of take that into account with their other medications, right? Uh, so always keep that in mind. Um, as far as bipolar disorder, I'm not going to ask you drug levels specifically, but I may ask you to make interpretations. Uh, you'll probably see this more on the neurology section, um, but you know, if, it, if a case comes up and it says, you know, a patient comes in, um, you know, for routine checkup and you get a blood level, say, of, you know, what's a, what's a drug we can get levels on for bipolar disorder? Lithium. lithium. Okay, so let's say he's on lithium um, and the level comes back and it's 0.8. Um, and I'll give you the reference range. Uh, it says, you know, like 0.6 to 1.2. Um, but the guy is having a noticeable fine tremor um, and he's complaining, he's just kind of more forgetful and he's just not really, he's kind of in a mental fog a lot of the times. What do you want to do with his therapy, right? So I'll give you options. Like, do you want to increase the dose? Probably not, right? Because he's having toxicity. Um, but, you know, you have to make that interpretation. Like, his level's within range, but he's having toxicity, right? So it's going to be one of those things like, do you change therapy? Potentially, yeah, it could be a good indication. Like if he's at a therapeutic range and he's already having these kind of effects, um, you know, maybe this is not the drug for him. Maybe something like a carbamazepine or maybe something like a valproic acid is going to be better for that patient, right? Um, so you have options like that. We have to kind of make the best decision um, by the patient. You know, it won't be, uh, I won't be trying to trick you guys. It'll be pretty obvious as far as, you know, it'll be someone like with a level that's like, say he comes in with level 1.3 and the range is 1.6 you know, to 1.2. Uh, he's having no symptoms and his bipolar is really well controlled. What do you want to do? Nothing, right? So you need to be able to interpret like, okay, how do I treat the patient, not just the number uh, then I'm getting back, okay? Probably focus more on that neurology, but it may come up on this test. 
Um, what are some of the differences between like a first generation and a second generation uh, antipsychotic? Side effect uh, profile is very different. Why is it different? How's the mechanism different? So said so first generations are really good about blocking dopamine, right? So block dopamine. So how do the second generations uh, differ? Block serotonin receptors, right? So they're going to have some serotonin antagonism. Uh, this is what differentiates the second generation from the first generation, and that's why you see less EPS. You see less tardive dyskinesia with your second generation agents um, because of that, those serotonin effects, right? Um, so in general, you're going to see a different side effect profile, uh, probably a little bit safer in, in general, um, but you're going to still see uh, some other side effects. Like what's, a, what's some of the big ones that you can run into with the second generation drugs? Yeah, so you can see some QT prolongation. You can see that with some of the first generations too. Um, so really metabolic effects are huge here, right? So especially with things like olanzapine, like weight gain, glucose intolerance, hyperlipidemia, all this can be worsened with all your second generation agents, right? Uh, especially if you can add on the fact that they're more sedate, like you know, all these drugs have sedative effects so they're sitting around more and not really doing as much, you know, that can all kind of compound on itself, right? So, so be aware of that. I've seen patients who put on 30, 40, 50 pounds, no problem when after being put on uh, olanzapine and that was like the only drug that worked for them. So it was kind of one of those things where they had to, um, you know, kind of do some non-pharmacological therapies to try to counteract some of that right okay um and be aware of the side effects so like if i was you had a patient had an acute dystonic reaction after say taking haloperidol how could i treat that so if i'm having too much effect from blocking dopamine now, now i know i have too much acetylcholine activity which is causing this dystonic reaction and give them no i don't give them l dopa this is where you give them like Benadryl, right? Or you give them uh, cogentin or triaxfenadol, right? An anticholinergic that can counteract some of those effects, right? So look at this, uh, those kind of unique side effects. Look to see what you can do about them as far as treatment goes, right? So it'll be important to know. Okay. Uh, know about anxiety in, in the onset of, of the drug. So something like uh, an SSRI, how long would that take to help fix my anxiety? Four to six weeks. Okay, what could I use something for like an immediate? Like if I was really scared about coming up here and talking about uh, this test review. Uh, okay, so benzos are good. Uh, what's another option? Beta block or something like that, right? So, and again, um, you know, the beta blockers are really just dealing with those kind of physical manifestations of that kind of hyped up sympathetic nervous system, right? So they deal with the sweating, the tremor, all that kind of good stuff. Um, benzos are, you know, you run the risk of having more uh, CNS depression, right? So, um, you know, if I have to do a kind of mentally uh, challenging task and I don't want to be nervous for it like maybe a benzo is not the best option right um, when should I take those medications an hour before. about an hour before hour 30 minutes beforehand um, again you want them to take it like right at the onset of the event because that's going to be too late uh, you want them to take it too early so look at the you know kind of duration of action of your drugs things like that um, how about ADHD how do we treat that Give them meth, right? <laughs> amphetamine, essentially, yeah. So give them amphetamines. That's kind of um, that's kind of one of your big uh, groups of therapy, right? So you have like your your Adderalls and your Ritalins and your uh, methylphenidates and things like that. So those are your main class. What other drugs could you use potentially? Stratera, which is SNRI? it's an SNRI. You guys know the generic. Adamoxetine is one, right? So that's uh, one drug. Uh, it's a little bit different because it's an SNRI, but it's nice because it's non-controlled, right? So that's one, one benefit to that drug. Um, what else could you use? Guanfacine. Guanfacine. Clonidine could also be used in that, in that category as well. So you're kind of using kind of a downer uh, for those. So it's the alpha-2 agonist effects that uh, may, be, may be useful for some patients. So again, keep in mind your different mechanisms there and, and what kind of side effects you can expect to see from those. Okay. So any questions on, on behavioral stuff? Review your mechanisms, expected side effects, how to deal with those side effects. That's huge. Huge. Okay. GI. We already talked about GI, so I don't probably have to talk about this too much. Um, if I have a NSAID-induced ulcer, how should I treat that? Stop the NSAID. Stop the NSAID. number one. Okay, what do I do after that? And PPI? Okay. Where's the one that increased the mucus? Prostol? Yep, misoprostol could be another one that can help uh, uh, enhance that, that mucosal barrier. That's a good one. PPIs will certainly work. Carefake can help, yeah. Um, what if I can't afford a PPI? 
H2 blocker can be used as well, right? So uh, which H2 blocker do you never want to use? Cemetidine. Cemetidine, right? Because it does what? Has a lot of drug interactions by SIP, SIP. SIP. 3A4. Oh, Inhibition. <laughs> Keep this straight. Yep. You had a 50 50 chance on, on those, right? Okay. Give uh, men's breasts too. Hmm? Gynecomastia. Okay. <laughs> that, that's probably more important to some of your gentlemen <laughs> patients, yes. One thing to be. Uh, Watch out for it. Good. Um, and, and again, look at your comparative classes of antiemetics and how their mechanisms kind of differ from one another. Um, again, you'll see some of those phenothiazines that have antipsychotic like actions. Um, so you can block dopamine, you can block serotonin, like their side effect profiles are going to differ from, from one to another, right? So a fenergan is not going to be the same as a zofran. It's not going to be the same as um, something like a reglan, you know? So a little bit different um, flavor for each of those. Um, let's see. I think. And again, we were talking about you know IBS and you see uh, Crohn's disease, how the different meds are going to be affecting that, which meds might be uh, appropriate for one disease state versus another. So, so be aware for that. Okay. Um, orthopedics. So, say I have a patient who's coming into the ER. They just uh, broke their femur, sticking out. What do you want to do for them? Besides lots of antibiotics. Right, so I probably should do it. They're screaming at you. They say, oh my gosh, I'm in so much pain. What do you give them? Heard some morphine. Okay, so morphine, how do you want to give it? IV. IV? Okay, good. So morphine IV is a very good acute pain option. What else can I give in addition to that? Well, I'm already giving them an opioid if I don't want to, if I want to use another, say, adjuvant type medication. Well, I can give them, I give them multiple doses of morphine, but just in that acute phase. Lots of inflammation happening there. Inset, right? So you can use insets in addition, right? So it's not uncommon for someone to get, say, something like, what's a good IV inset? Toradol. Yeah, so tramadol is a different thing, right? That's that look like sandalite problem you run into, where if you get that mixed up, then I'll, you know, accidentally, you know, say, oh, get them tramadol in addition to that morphine, and all of a sudden they're respiratory depressed, right? That could be a problem. Okay. Um, so yeah, toradol is a very good IV NSAID you can use um, in conjunction with opioids, right? Because it has opioid sparing effects, right? Um, you can even add some Tylenol on there too. I don't know, how, you know, it might be not doing a whole lot for, for you know, femur sticking out of there. Leg, but you know it could potentially uh, have some additional help there, right? Um, say they're allergic to morphine. It's dilated. Hydromorphone might be an okay option. Again, you run some risk of cross reactivity just because the structures are not completely different. So if I want to use something, say fully synthetic, what could I use? Fentanyl is a good one. Anything else? Could you use benzos for like a twilight anesthesia sort of thing? Um, they will probably get some benzos at some point. It depends on kind of what's going on. So especially patients who are like super ramped up, freaked out, like they might get some benzos just for the kind of the anxiolysis effect. Um, you may have, uh, if you were going to do like a, a reduction of a fracture, uh, especially like, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying like in, in, acutely in the ER, like if you're reducing a fracture, you may get some benzos um, in addition to kind of help with that kind of anesthetic effect, kind of that retrograde amnesia, uh, kind of help them forget a lot about what's going on. And that can be useful as well, right? Those are some options. Um, right, so you can use something like hydromorphone potentially. There could be some cross reactivity there, so you got to be careful. Um, you know, if someone said, oh, i got a morphine allergy, what do you think it's really usually due to? Still itchy because the histamine releases. Exactly. So histamine release is a big one, so you get itchy, you get rash. What else do you see with that? What happens to your blood pressure? Yeah, because you see a drop in blood pressure, so hypotension can be seen with that. You lose a lot of that when you move on to, to other opioids like hydromorphone or something. Uh, good. Okay, so... Again, keep in mind how to treat pain. So like, you know, chronic baseline pain is going to need more long acting medications, right? So this is where you get like your PCA with basal rates. They're being consistently given. Or you have long acting, you know, controlled release medications like oxycodone, you know, oxycontins, you know, lasting for, you know, eight to 12 hours or so. Um, 
there's actually a really interesting um, expose. I don't know if it's an expose is the right word or an editorial or something I was reading about um, the marketing of OxyContin when it originally came out. Um, one of the big things that the, the manufacturer was pushing was that it's only twice a day. You only have to give it twice a day. And what they actually found was in a lot of the clinical trials, patients were not being well controlled with just twice a day dosing. They really needed three times a day daily dosing. But their whole marketing was around, nope, you only have to give this drug twice a day. So there's a lot of kind of interesting um, competing kind of um, uh, uh, there's a lot of conflicts of interest between like prescribers being told only give it twice a day versus what the actual efficacy of it was um, with the the patients and and so you can Google that and, and find that but it's very interesting to see um, just how the the a lot of the financials and the marketing kind of plays into somehow how these drugs are being uh, marketed. Um, okay, so what kind of adverse effects can I expect to see from the opioids? Constipation is a big one, especially with chronic use. What else? Respiratory depression you worry about. Tolerance develops, right? So it's going to happen anytime you're on an, an opioid. Uh, is everyone going to become addicted at some point? Everyone. Not everyone's going to become addicted, right? Everyone becomes tolerant. Everyone may develop physical dependence to it, to where they have withdrawal effects when you remove the opioid, but not everyone's going to be addicted, right? Um, keep in mind that difference between there. Um, you know, there are patients who can you know, or may have to be on these opioids for years and years and years, and they're never really at that point where they're addicted, where they're continuing use despite, you know, known self-harm. Um, but they may need ramping up doses because they develop tolerance to that, right? And anyone who's on those meds chronically, if you take it that away, they have withdrawal effects, which what are some withdrawal effects you can see from opioids? Shaking, yeah. some tremor. What happens to the guts if I take away the opioids? Um, yeah. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea can be a big one. Call code brown. You actually give too much of the reversal agent. They're going to be really agitated, sweating. They're going to look like they're they they're going to want to die, right? They're going to feel horrible uh, when they're coming off of that stuff. So be aware of those withdrawal effects. Um, how could I put someone into withdrawal like immediately? Yeah, naloxone or Narcan, you can give the, the antagonist, right? So that's usually something we try to avoid if possible, uh, but sometimes it just comes about, especially if a patient is, you know, completely obtunded and, and about to get by a tube, um, we can go ahead and, and give them some Narcan to reverse that, right? Because that works as an opioid receptor antagonist. Um, remember, there are some that work specifically on the GI tract that are good for, like, kind of post-operative um, ileus or trying to wake up the GI tract after surgery to try to get them uh, discharged a little bit faster. Um, so there's some options there that they don't cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and then how, how do you manage a VTE? Someone has a, has a clot. What do you want to do for them? Heparin's one option. What's good to use? Low molecular weight heparin, like Lovenox. Yeah, so low molecular weight heparin, like Lovenox or Noxoparin is a good option there. Uh, Fondaparinux, right? What's kind of the difference in, in activity between like a low molecular weight heparin and a heparin? The clotting factors that it affects. So it affects the clotting factors differently. What does a Noxoparin favor? Yeah, factor 10, right? So uh, heparin can affect factor 2, 10, 9, 11, 12. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a lot of them, but 2 and 10 are the big ones, right? Um, with anoxaparin, uh, and especially with the Rixtra or Fondaparinox, factor 10 is going to be the primary thing there, right? Rixtra is only going to affect uh, factor 10. So your monitoring changes, right? So for heparin, you monitor what? APTT. APTT. And then for something like anoxaparin, what do you measure? Anti-factor 10A levels, okay? Monitoring changes there, and then um, do I just leave them on that for forever, or what do I do? Yeah, typically you bridge them, which means you start them up on something like Warfarin, or you could switch them over to one of the newer anticoagulants, something like a Rivaroxaban or Dabigatran. Right, go back and review those so you know what the mechanisms are and what their their risks are. Um, and then usually they're on for three months or so, as long as there's no other kind of irreversible risk factors there. Okay, what if they couldn't be? Um, what if I couldn't anticoagulate them? you do the claw yeah. the claw yeah you can do ivc filter um put that in and, and try to catch any clots before they get travel up to the lungs right now if they were to have like a pe how can i treat that yeah so uh if it's like kind of a more stable pe like you know if they're not, not having a catastrophic like you know decrease in blood pressure and all that kind of stuff um you can get away with using kind of treatment doses mm -hmm. of your heparins right so you can do like a heparin drip or you can do more treatment doses higher doses of, of anoxaparin uh if you were having kind of an unstable pe or something um you could either do you know systemic like tpa as a clot buster as a the fibrinolytic or you could do more like catheter um guided uh, administration of that right so a lot, a lot of benefits to doing that um just because you kind of limit systemic uh, exposure to to TPA, decrease the bleeding risk. Any questions on that stuff?
Who should get medical marijuana? Everyone? That'll be the answer on the test. We'll just say everyone. <laughs> Not right. have that on tape, so. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be on YouTube. Yeah, Dr. Wood said everyone can get medical marijuana. <laughs> Glaucoma. Glaucoma. Cancer. Cancer. Essentially, you can prescribe it for anything you want as long as you got the training for it, right? So um, they always put that caveat in the law. It says it's, you know, for anything you think it might be weighing the benefits might outweigh the risk. Um, but really, the like I mentioned, um, there's, there's some evidence out there. It's probably okay, but it's not going to be first-line therapy, right? So, for instance, if you have uh, cancer-related nausea vomiting, we have other drugs for that first, right? Use those first. If they fail those, we have FDA-approved THC-based products. We have dronabinol. We have nabilone. Use those first. You don't have to necessarily jump straight to um, using the, the medical marijuana. Right? Are there drugs that induce hunger? Um, we have appetite stimulants. Uh, for sure, there's a drug called ciproheptanine. We mentioned um, using it for like serotonin syndrome, has some serotonin antagonist effects. That has some appetite stimulating effects. Um, there's another one called medigestrol um, that will do it as well. Um, so there's some options out there for appetite stimulation, but yeah, marijuana is you know frequently uh, said to be beneficial for that standpoint as well. A lot of it, a lot of the the hunger issues is more related to the appetite issues, more related to nausea vomiting. So sometimes if you get that under control, then they're okay to eat. You know, so if you feel nauseous, you're not going to want to try to eat anything. But. Okay, um, so any questions on that section? All right, uh, the last one we did was ob gyn So again, keep in mind about the rationale when you would use an estrogen versus a progestin product uh, for your patient. So for instance, uh, say I have a 16 year old female uh, who is wanting to go on oral contraception, uh, what type of therapy should she get? Combination, just estrogen, just progestin. Combo, right? She needs because she has an intact uterus, right? Uh, presumably, she has, she has a otherwise healthy female. She has an intact uterus. You want to go ahead and give uh, combination therapy, right? Uh, what's my other option for her? Estrogen only, or progestin only. Progestin only, right? Because if you give an estrogen only, what, what would I run the risk of? Well, we run the risk of clotting. But if I just had unopposed estrogen effect on on the on the uterus. Cancer, right? You can see uh, endometrial cancer, um, don't want to have that, right? So that's why you end up having the combination there because the progestin helps to kind of slough off that material uh, later on, right? Or helps to kind of keep the, uh, the growth of the endometrium in check, okay? So that's the, the big uh, benefit of having that combination therapy there because otherwise if it's unopposed, it's going to keep growing and growing and growing, and that's when you're in that risk of having cancerous cells start to pop up. So um, what's kind of the, what is the drawback of using progestin-only therapy? Not as effective, right? So increased failure rate. What else? So like delayed ovulation, right? Getting back to kind of a normal cycle, especially if you're using like the IM depot shot, like that kind of have some delayed uh, effects there. Um, what if I had a patient who could not receive, uh, you know, hormonal therapy? What could I do for them? Hmm? Yeah, use the copper IUD, right? Or implantable uterine device. Um, so you can use copper to do that. Pennies are not nearly as effective, so <laughs> self-therapy is not recommended for that. Anything else? Absence. I'm just kidding. Uh, not absence. Um, yeah, so other backup forms of, of uh, protection obviously can, can be useful as well. So not everything has to be pharmacologic necessarily. Um, okay, so what are some of the benefits of, say, using like just a, a first, now we're talking about, say, a postmenopausal woman, hormone replacement therapy. What's the benefit of just using something like, um, like a estrogen cream? Yeah, fewer systemic side effects, right? So, what or what is, kind of risk does that mitigate? Heart. Right. So, if it's just acting locally, so especially if they're having like you know um, uh, atrophic vaginitis or something like that, like those locally applied things will kind of limit a lot of the systemic side effects you can see there. Um, what about like a transdermal uh, estrogen product? No first pass yeah, so the, the first pass effect is a big thing there. So oral therapy is going to hit the liver, you get that first pass where you can see increase in clotting factors generating. That's where you can also see like risk for like cholecystitis and things. Um, so by giving like a transdermal product, you mitigate some of that and maybe have less risk for clots and whatnot. Okay. Um, so that, that's some, some benefit to using a product like that. Um, what if uh, a concerned 23-year-old female calls up and says, oh my gosh, I just realized I forgot to take my birth control today. I usually take it in the morning. Now it's like, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon. What can I do? Just take it. Okay. What if they call you up and said, oh my gosh, I did it again. I forgot to take two days worth. 
yeah, so try to do that little catch up there for two days worth. What did they say? Oh my gosh, I forgot a whole week. You say you need something else. You need like an implantable something or other, right? You're, you're just not good at taking pills. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a demo or something like that would be good for them. Um, good, yeah, so again, uh, and then if I say I wanted to like reschedule uh, their, their menstrual period, uh, what could I do? Hmm? Yeah, so just keep taking continual active drug, right? So, and again, it's pretty easy to tell which ones are placebo pills because they're a different color. Um, so have them skip that and just keep taking it until after their event has occurred, and then they can kind of restart um, on, on a new cycle. Okay, uh, any questions on that? Just talking about this just now, I just realized at some point my daughter might actually need to use some of these products, and I just sent a shiver down my spine. <laughs> yep. I can see it. Concerned look of a father over there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? All right, I'm going to post this up. I'll put these slides up there um, for your review as well. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me uh, as much as you can before the test. I'll try to get back to you as I can. Um, anything else? All right, I'll see you guys Monday morning, I guess. Thank you.